Hello, my name is Benjamin Kwashi. I'd like to be considering for a moment Paul's letter to Titus and chapter 3. But before we get into that chapter, I'd like to point out a few things. First of all, at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul turns now to consider how the Christian should live in the community and in his nation. Actually, a Christian is not living in isolation, he's living in the world. And the key that Paul puts out to Titus is love. Titus himself must have a heart full of love. Love for God, love for his job, love for his calling, love for his people. If you yourself are not full of love in your heart, the people will run away. And this is a warning that Paul gives to Titus, which Titus was wise enough to heed. If you are not neat and your environment is dirty, then in itself is a sign that you have no love for your work and that you do not love or respect the Lord who called you. The way you do things will make people come to you or go away. Your life has to be in evidence that God has truly called you. Love will change not only individual lives, but also whole communities in Africa. One of the typical examples, and it's still true even now, is if someone comes to you to ask your help, maybe for some food or money or some form of assistance, and you render it, that person goes back to his village and tells everybody to thank you profusely wherever they see you for being of such a great assistance to that one person. And it's such an embarrassment when you go around and everybody's greeting you. Thank you so much, sir, for helping Mr. Such and So. Thank you so much. And you wonder you've helped only one person. But that's not the end of the story. When somebody else needs help, where will they go to? Of course, to the same willing horse. And sometimes it's so funny in my context and culture that I say to them, please do not drive a willing horse to death. But it is also true when they go to ask for assistance and you are unable to help or unwilling to help, the whole village knows about it. So love can either draw people to you or love can pull people away from you. Love is very critical. It also makes you have an influence over those who listen to you, those who come under your teaching, those who come under your, 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 your practical tutelage. Love will make you a laborer, a faithful worker for the Lord. Titus is called to remind the people of Crete. Verse 1. Remind the people of Crete. In the Old Testament, the people were frequently urged to remember what God has done. This is particularly clear in the story of the wanderings in the wilderness. When time and time and again, they were told, when at last they reached the promised land, they must remember all that had happened. When they forgot, trouble came. We too forget so very easily. And we get into trouble. When we forget the love of God, how God so loved the world, what he has done, what we would have been without the Lord Jesus Christ. And we embrace the gospel, but it doesn't take too long. We tend to forget. We must remember the grace of God. We must remember the love of God. So Paul is calling on Titus to always constantly remind the people he's been called to serve, the love of God. Verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for any good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be genuine, and to show perfect courtesy towards all men. God's way is the way of love. And therefore the Christian should be law-abiding and ready for every good work at all times. Slander, useless quarrels, have no place in the gospel. A Christian shows forbearance and gentleness in his dealings with other people. 
Because not the whole world will be believers at the same time. But the aim of the Christian is constantly to mirror the love of God as he does his business in the society to be able to win lives to Jesus. He is not a purposeless person. A Christian is not just a wanderer and not knowing where he's going and where he's coming from. No, we've been saved and we have a hope for eternity. So by the love of God, we live in this world in the present in order to draw people to know what we know, to enjoy what we enjoy, and to go on to heaven. A Christian shows all of these in an unbelieving world in order to draw people to Christ. So Christ is the main agent of change. Verse 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by men and hating one another. But when goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. This saying is true. Now, Paul urges the church, the Christians, he urges us not to look on our pagan neighbors with contempt and with pride. No. Because once upon a time, we were like that. But for the grace of God, we were like them. Paul, Titus, and all Christians must never forget what God has done in their own lives. It is that remembrance that produces in us sympathy to walk gently, to talk nicely, to, to pray earnestly, to, to weep and, and to, to, to even want to give our lives for other people that they may know Jesus. Because, but for the grace of God, there we were. We were once no better than these pagans, or like the unbelievers, but we have been saved and put in a right relationship with God through the goodness and loving kindness of God himself through Jesus Christ. We could never deserve this. We could never earn it by anything we do. We simply receive it with humble gratitude. Not with proud self-satisfaction, but with humility. The love and grace of God are mediated to us through the church, and particularly through the sacraments of baptism. A person is reborn, life begins all over again, and there is renewing through the power of the Holy Spirit. No amount of organization or good deeds can bring this about in the life of any individual or in the life of a church. Revival comes from waiting upon God, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit. The effect is threefold. Past sins are forgiven. Life is now a new quality. Lived with Christ, there is sure hope of even greater life, which is yet to come. There is a new life which brings us into direct relationship with God. We talk with God right now in prayer, and he answers us. The one who is genuinely born anew never gives us hope. We never give up hope. We're always trusting in the Lord. And finally, we're called to live for Christ. Verse 8, I desire you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to apply themselves to good deeds. These are excellent and profitable to men, but avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels over the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. As for a man who is fascist, after, after admonishing him once or twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person 
is perverted and sinful, he is self-condemned. Once more, Paul insists that Christian faith must result in Christian character and action. Endless intellectual discussions on his own is a dead end. The legal debate can enslave. When some people are born again, they go a step forward in holiness, then five step backwards in legalism as they set out laws concerning details of dress and sometimes of appearance. Love covers all of these. The real quality, the int eternal, internal quality is not there. Such laws, uh, such laws enslaves people. Jesus calls everyone to come, to repent, and to be purified, and begin a new life in him. Some groups, however, want to examine a person, his or her repentance first, and then a particular type of person, if he's allowed to come into the church. The one who makes such prescriptions are slave masters and interpret the Bible their own way. They do not bring people to Christ, but into their own kind of faith. We know the genuine gospel by the way it changes our characters, by the love with which it receives people. The true gospel leaves no room for personal pride. It must show itself in good deeds. It is not a matter of race. It's not a matter of nationality. It's not even a matter of status or intellectual capacity. It is love in action, drawing people and bringing all people, all races, gender together under the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul finally gives these words. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to send to speed Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to apply themselves to good deeds so as to help cases of urgent need. And do not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. These are final greetings. And these greetings give us a glimpse of the team ministry of which Paul and Titus were a part. Paul intends to send to Crete someone who would completely take over the place with the love of Jesus Christ. Titus was there. The Lord is looking for people who will change the world with his love, who will demonstrate the grace of God in difficult circumstances. God is looking for men and women who will go to difficult places and draw people to Christ. Will you be the one? God bless you.